Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the ME7 podcast. It's not quite the podcast we were hoping to bring you on this uh, rather sombre feeling Bank Holiday Monday. We're hoping to be here talking you through how the Jewels regain their status as a League One club for the 10th successive season. But unfortunately, the worst has come to pass and Jewels will be playing League Two football for the upcoming campaign after a 2-0 loss at home to Rotherham United, a result that meant the Millers propelled themselves back into the Championship whilst the Jewels fell through that ever-closing trap door into League Two football. I'm joined today by Reese Hurd and Lewis Brown in to dissect not just the result on Saturday, but the season as a whole, where it went wrong and everything that's led us to the position we're in now. So, Lewis, I'll go to you first. Um, I know for talking to you from previous games, you've been quite the optimist in uh, certain games, but what was your genuine feeling both before the game coming into this and then the crushing feeling as it was at the end when the full-time whistle went? And obviously, we all know what that meant. Yeah, evening, everyone. Um, yeah, I was slightly optimistic for some games. You know, I spoke to you before the Fleetwood game, I went and I was... I was hopeful, I was positive about it. And I came out of that game really angry because we didn't get what we needed to get. And, you know, many things have cost us this season. If we won the Fleetwood game, we'd have been fine. But, you know, you can't point point to one thing at this point. Um, before the Rotherham game, I wasn't hopeful at all. You know, you always have that little glimmer of hope. But, you know, I didn't, I didn't really have that. There's always something in the back of your mind that says, you know, um, could we do it today? Could, could we, could it happen? But then... When, when the result happened, I thought it, it was what everyone expected. And at full time, you know, it was it was a sinking feeling, but I think it was a feeling everyone expected. And there was a little bit of hope when Bolton went ahead against Fleetwood and only needed one goal. But yeah, the worst did come to worse. And uh, and yeah, it, it feels weird that it's finally happened because I did think we would get out of it, but, but we didn't. Yeah, Reese. as Lewis said, it's can't, it can't really pin it down to one thing because there's been so many examples of season in specific games, like not holding on at Cheltenham, the late goal at Sunderland, not beating Fleetwood, not beating Wimbledon, you could go on forever. But as been one of those really strange seasons, isn't it, where a team who's finished on 40 points like we have only just been relegated. I think in normal seasons, you'd be well adrift by that point on 40 points. And Fleetwood as well, also on 40, a team who won one game. And I think it was, I think it was the last 20 in the end, as it turned out. Wimbledon, obviously, who did go down with us. Hadn't won since December as well. So it's been one of those seasons where the bottom four or five have been well cut adrift from everyone else in the league. And I think in, in as I said, another season, we would have been with that point so long, long by, by that point. So what does it say about the league this season? Not just Jill's case, but how poor it's been down there. That team, a team who've won one game in 19, got 40 points and still managed to stay up. And a team like us and ourselves who finished the same amount of points who have been dreadful have only managed to take it down to the last game and still had a chance. Yeah, I think I think I know Nils Harris mentioned it in his comments after the Rotherham game that the the gulf between the top half and the bottom half in League One is only getting wider. Um, I think he referenced Portsmouth getting seventy three points and only just about scraping tenth. Um, and yeah, any any of the bottom six in League One, to be honest, deserve to go down this season. Um, obviously, they can't change each year the amount that go down based on points. It's only going to be four two. We're going to survive. Um, so yeah. 40 points we absolutely deserve what we got in terms of relegation but it is also frustrating that despite how poor we was um like you referenced with Wimbledon's record Fleetwood's record these teams kept giving us chance after chance after chance even on Saturday when Fleetwood obviously were winning they went behind once equalized went behind again giving us another lifeline and it seemed like for the last sort of four or five games they kept giving us chances and we just couldn't take them. I think we all said that that Easter weekend was going to be the pivotal one. Um, we needed four points from the six games. And I think we all agreed that if we got the four points, we was going to survive. As it turns out, it would have been enough. But yeah, after the Fleetwood game not beating them, I'd, I'd accepted that Portsmouth and, and Rotherham were going to lead to no points and we was going to end up going down. Yeah, Lewis, let's take it back to right at the beginning of the season. I think one thing we've been accustomed to at that point with Steve Evans is that he does make signings that ultimately a lot of them point more than more work out, more don't work out, sorry, than do. And it's one of those cases in which that led on to what happened in January as well. But for the start of the season, we could see it was a team that wasn't quite the team of old, the two teams before that got the two 10th plate finishes. Obviously, you have to take in losing Jordan Graham, who is by far and away our best player in that league uh, in our time in those two seasons. Conor Ogilvy as well, another one who went and it 
it, it seemed very often. I think <laughs> Bruce, I remember us saying when we went to um, Wimbledon, I think it was the, was it third or fourth game of the season, we'd just been to Ports for a few days before. It was like, well, surely it can't get any worse than that. Little did we know <laughs> all these months later that, in fact, it could. But I, I, want, I want to touch on recruitment, Lewis, with you, because a lot of people have been, you know, pointing out Scally, pointing out Evans. You know, no, I don't think I've seen anyone blame Neil Harris, and I hope it stays that way because it's very silly if you're of that point of view. But when he brings in the players he did a lot of them just haven't been up to standard they've all been there with neil harris in january as um as we saw he had about what three or four hours of the transfer window when he came in brought in ben thompson but he had this whole crux of a squad left behind one that couldn't defend couldn't score albeit we've got slightly better in the defensive uh, setup even that's drifted off a little bit towards the end i think it was just one of those where you have to, to look at Lil Harris and say, despite us having actually gone down, he's done a great job to actually keep us within the chance of getting out of it for as long as he did. Yeah, I mean, as you say, Neil Harris, for me, has no blame attached to him at all here. We were 10 points adrift when he came in, he got us out. And to be within a shout of survival in the last few minutes of the season was incredible. Um, in recruitment, you know, People like to point fingers at Paul Scally, Steve Evans. We'll never really know the true ins and outs, I suppose. But yeah, Paul Scally addressed in his open letter, didn't he, about the budget Steve Evans had and the decisions he made, etc. Ultimately, Scally giving him that power, so you, you do have to put some blame there. But yeah, the team put together were, was poor. Um, I think we were struggling. I remember when Ryan Jackson joined and people sort of thought, OK, a couple of years ago, um, OK, that's fine. And then Ollie Lee joined and it seemed like every summer we were struggling really because of a budget or whatever but yeah the team put together it, it wasn't good you know you just think of the jordan graham or um someone like that even even late this season you know there's no pace there's no width there's no anything like the options weren't even there to do that really it was just staggering how poor the squad was and um, for every kyle dempsey there was a lee hodson or an uc say or something like that and mr for you know, just really bizarre signings for me or risks that, that didn't come off. And yeah, you do you do have to question it. And Neil Harris was very frank and honest in his interviews after the game on on uh, on Saturday and fair play to him because, you know, he's not going to settle for that standard. You know, he's not a League Two manager. Um, he said a football club won't represent it. That represents him won't won't be like that. And hopefully that that's the case next season and things do get better with him and Nicky Shorey in charge of things now. Yeah, Rich, you mentioned it on Twitter the other day where both Neil Harris and Steve Evans have both come out and talked about the budget, saying it's the lowest budget in the league. I remember Scally came out, I think one of his, whatever they were called, chairman's chats back in before in the season when he said that, uh, when he was still here, of course, that Steve Evans had a really good budget. He's come up recently and say it's the best budget that the Gillingham team have had in recent years. But there must be something in it because I know a lot of people when Evans said it was the lowest budget, they might have thought about it as Evans just trying to, you know, poke at Scully a bit, trying to get him to do something. But when when both when two number uh, two managers both come out and say the same thing about the budget being the lowest, when the chairman somewhat goes goes ahead and contradicts that, there must be something in that for both managers to come out and say it as well. No, without a doubt, and I think you only have to look at the squad we've had this season in terms of quality and in terms of numbers that. Unless Scali has sanctioned players being signed on contracts ridiculously above what they should be, then I don't see how this is the highest budget we've ever had in this league. And to be fair to Harris, he was quite scathing about Evans. Without mentioning him, he was quite scathing about Evans' reign in some aspects. But the budget was the one thing that he did sit bang in line with Evans. You know, a lot of people sort of made a laugh and joke about Evans always going about bottom of the league budget and so on and so forth. But fairness to Evans, that was the one thing in Harris's interview after Saturday's game that he went bang in line with and he said exactly the same thing. He said since he's come in, um, we've had a bottom of the league budget um, and that should get you bottom of the league. And what, what I did find interesting with Harris's interview after the game is that he said himself that had he been brought in 24 hours earlier to have an extra 24 hours in the window, he thinks he'd have kept us up. No, I think so as well. I think that extra 24 hours could be very important. I think the fact that we gave him, what, I don't know what I said, about like four or five hours just to get the one player in, in itself was impressive in that sort of time span. But Lewis, I want to talk to you about something else that Neil Harris said. The thing that most people picked up on immediately, I think it came from his Sky interview first, where he said about the seven players under contract, that he doesn't want any of them. I think that's what he said at the time of the interview. But I think when you listen back to the full interview on Radio Ken, what he actually meant to say was, the seven won't be there. Some he doesn't really care if they go, but there are others that are in contract they'd like to keep, but might not be, might not be sticking around. I know you did your 
your tweet saying who you would keep and who didn't and i you know i did as well because i completely copied it off of you but um <laughs> with that with that comment that he made about the seven it really does need to be a big rebuilding job again this summer i know steve evans was known for it but you've got to remember this is not so much neil harris just rebuilding his own squad because i believe these are his players this is him picking the bones out of what steve evans left behind and trying to build a new squad that's capable for pushing in in the two i think if you want to just sort of summarize some of the players you went through in your list about who the ones you would want to keep and and the ones you did i'm not speaking to go for every single one because it's going to take up the rest of the program but um and i really so i do this in as well when when lewis says a player you can pitch in and say what you think as opposed to him as well and see what we can come up with in terms of the players that we do have left behind yeah, I, th I think it was an interesting one to start with about the contracted players. You know, for some reason, we're not really announcing lengths anymore. The only one we, we know is Stuart O'Keefe. Um, it's definitely contracted for next season because uh, he said it himself. But apart from that, it's anyone's guess, really, who the seven are. Um, as you said, Owen, I did a bit of a list. You know, the obvious ones you'd expect not to not to return. Um, for Dan Oliver's going to be off. Uh, you know, like Pontus Dahlberg, Dan Phillips, you can't see them coming back. Um I think the fullbacks is an interesting one because both have shown promise at times. Um, Ryan Jackson, Dave Tutonda. For me personally, I'd move both on. I think you can see players in there, but they make too many mistakes. Um, Ryan Jackson has struggled at the weekend again, struggled massively at Portsmouth. Reese, I, I don't know what your thoughts are on the two fullbacks at League Two level. Um, to be honest, I'd pit, put the fullbacks in the exact same position as all the defenders. Um, Harris has said himself, he said up at Saturday, he said, since I come in, I want to play a back four. I can't do that because I can't trust these players. Pretty scathing of the lot of them, to be honest. And I, I expect Tucker will move on, whether he's under contract, whether he's not. I think it's probably best for him and the club now that he tries to kick his career on a little bit. The rest of them, yeah, can go for me. Um, Masterson, maybe if Harris wants to try and get him back in, in League 2, I wouldn't be against that because I thought he looked a pretty good signing for us when he came in. He, he ended a little bit wobbly the last couple of games, but for the most part, he... He made a big difference when he came into that back three, but the rest of them, yeah, I'm, I'm not not particularly fussed on. Um, Mackenzie, maybe. Um, my my concern with Mackenzie is injuries. Ability wise, I think he'd be good enough for League Two, but just whether Harris wants to give himself as much chance as possible and sort of question marks over injuries for certain players may sway his decision. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think we definitely need to get the the forward department much improved this year because you look at the state of it this season. I think was it 13 home goals this season. I think. Uh, only 10 of them were from open play. I think we have three penalties in there as well, which made it a 13. It's just not been good enough at all. I mean, you look at the players we've got up there. Oliver, as good as a striker, he's proved to be at this level. He can't do it all on his own. You've had Mustafa Carriol, who we've seen once in about three months, if we're lucky, because he's just far too injury prone. Most disappointing one would be Danny Lloyd, because he looked like he was going to be a big player under Neil Harris. But unfortunately, after just one game, that was him out of it due to his injury. Uh, Charlie Kelman, someone who can run around and put a shift in, but just not somebody you trust for goals. Tom Dixon-Peters. Uh, yeah, Juris Satole. Um, might might be one of those. I look at him with the likes of uh, Harvey Linton and Josh Chambers, if, who I think maybe because we have dropped the league, might find themselves getting a few more minutes, oh, excuse me, a few more minutes next season. Harvey Linton especially is one I hope it gets more minutes, especially if Jackson is gone. But yeah, going, going forward, it's been, it's, it's, it's been an absolute... Uh, <laughs> bit of a catastrophe this season i think you buy a season ticket for however much we bought them for and you see 13 goals at home this season it's just not anywhere near value for money but uh Reece, I, want to, I want to talk to you about something that came out last night from someone who was at the player of the year awards i'm not going to say who it is obviously but they said something that uh actually got it on, on a video record was something scally said and i texted it this morning because it uh, sort of got to me a bit he said that um he thought this was a really good group of players and he's proud of all of them and just because you're in a team that goes down doesn't mean it's a bad team. And he thinks we've done we've done quite well this season. I think um, a lot of Jules fans waking up and hearing that would have uh, been in quite a poor mood to start their Monday afternoon. What do you make of that? Because I don't really understand where he's coming from or where he's got that conclusion from having watched this all season. Um, all I say is on that is that there's a reason why Paul, Chester, Paul Scully is chairman of the football club and not the manager. That's all I'll say. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely do. It's why it's just it sort of adds to the uh, to whole season has been. You end it with a bit of ridiculousness as it's gone on with the whole year. Uh, Lewis, I don't want to don't want to go on to what happened on Saturday too much because it was basically just a rinse and repeat of of any any game we've had this season. I would say it basically sums up how we've been that whole game. It was one where 
we played a very good Rotherham team. We didn't necessarily get outclassed, but the problem is when you're playing this Gillingham team, you know that you don't have to outclass you. We don't have to play them off the park because you know you're going to get a chance at some point. Or we know as Gillingham fans, it's going to take what most likely a defensive error from the other side for us to get anywhere near a chance. I think that's basically that game just sort of summed up the whole season. A lot of huff, puff, never really looking like we're going to blow the house down and another goal. The first goal, especially, really poor giveaway, free header, much like at Cheltenham and at Portsmouth as well. And I think it's one of those games where it just sort of epitomised where we were come the end of it. Yeah, it's annoying that sort of thing, isn't it? You don't mind really being undone by a bit of class, but when it's a set piece, it's annoying, especially in such a big game where we needed to really keep it nil-nil for as long as we possibly could. Um yeah, I mean, as soon as Rotherham scored, you thought, oh, God, now we've got a score. And whenever we've got a score, it's it's not it's not fun because it never looks like happening, to be honest. And at Portsmouth, when their third one went in towards the start of the second half, I mean, you know, it was just a matter of, all right, we'll just look at how long's left now, see how many it goes up to, because we're not, we're, we're not going to score three in a game. And, you know, we're not going to equalise, not going to go on to win it. And it, as you say, I, I went earlier on, we've... we've We've slipped a bit defensively towards the back end of the season. You can see a few goals from set pieces, that sort of thing. Um, if Harris has said he can't trust the defenders, you know, we did get better when he came in. Um, but similar to what Reece said, as in he wouldn't he wouldn't mind any of the defenders leaving. I, I wouldn't really either. Um, I'm a big fan of Aaron Chapman. I think he made a couple of good saves and has done really well since since he come in. But on Saturday, yeah, it was, it was the same. We got undone um, and never never looked like doing anything at the other end, apart from, you know, one or two chances. Ben Thompson obviously hit the bar, but apart from that, never felt hopeful at all, really. Yeah, we should talk about that. And as I said earlier in the programme, there's been so many examples of different games where we should and could have got more points than we have, but it all just sort of comes down to, to the same problem. I think when you've got the worst home record of the league and you score 13 goals all season, you're not really in a position to be seeing yourself get relegated and thinking oh we were unlucky there with those sort of stats it's very much pointing to only you're only going one place and like I said earlier I think with the points so we've got we're lucky we've we've lasted this long and I wanted to wanted to ask about Paul Scully in, in himself because obviously a lot of people will blame him a lot of people will, will, will blame Evans and I want to go back to something he said in his um open letter that he released the other week which doesn't really sit right even more now considering where we've ended up but he mentioned about the issues of Evans and how we should have gone much longer for we obviously it's quite well known that we're offered compensation from Stevenage for Steve Evans. We rejected that, sacked him a little bit later, and then also had that gap in between with Steve Lovell coming in as well, which is a complete waste of time. And obviously Harris said himself he feels if he came in a bit earlier, then it could have been different. I do have to wonder to ask you, Reese, but I'm not saying you'll know what's going on, of course, but you have to, you have to question why he did hang on with Evans for so long when Clearly, the opportunity for Harris was there. And if we had taken it earlier, had a bit more of a transfer window, we might not have been in this position. But as it is, he dwindled on it, brought in Steve Lovell, which we all knew was never going to work. And now we're we're paying the price for it. Yeah, the whole timeline of the Scally Evan sort of fallout, so to speak, I don't think we'll ever get to the bottom of. Um, because the whole series of events doesn't add up. Because he said in his open letter that Evans changed back for, all the way back in the summer. Um, yet he managed our club until, is it late January? Over half the season. And I expect from Evans's point of view, he probably felt as though having got us consecutive top 10 finishes, then losing Bonham, losing Graham, losing Ogilvy, he probably thought, started to think, what more can I do here really? So I can see why he started to get a little bit frustrated and then started calling things out. But then, yeah, the Scully to admit that from the summer, Evans had changed to then let him continue as manager all the time. We were getting thrashed without really fighting in games. And then for Stevenage to offer, even if they didn't offer any compensation and they just said, we'll take him, it would have meant we didn't have to pay any payoff for sacking him two weeks later. So, yeah, the, the, the whole thing did, didn't make any sense. And, yeah, the decision to give it to Lovell for three weeks was ridiculous. But I know why that was. He, he gave it to him hoping that we'd win a couple of games under Lovell so he could give him the job. I still maintain that was the case. It, if we'd have beat Burton at home, Steve Lovell probably would have been manager to the end of the season. But the fact it somehow got worse um, and the fans continued to turn further, forced his hand into really pushing the boat out to get Harris in, I think. Yeah, so Lewis, I think we've got about five or so minutes left. We'll just have a quick look forward to uh, what next season could be. We've always said we need a massive rebuild. I think Harris has come out yesterday as well, said we need about 15 new players. And obviously, we know a lot of them are going to be going as well. And uh, we, we talked um, on our preview for the game on uh, Friday about how it's not so 
cut and dry and easy to get yourself back into League One after being straight relegated from a uh, from uh, League One. Um, I look at I look at the teams in League Two without it being disrespectful. There's not one that was sort of makes you makes you think, oh, I can't wait to play them. It's not like when you're looking at the League One fixtures, you think, where are we playing Sunderland or Derby or whatever. It's not really the case. Thinking, when are we playing Button? When are we going to um, Barrow or Harrogate? But um, what what needs to be done over the summer? Because obviously we brought in Nicky Shaw. We're going to be bringing in a lot of new players. It's going to be a massive restructure, and I think Harris has got a lot of people thinking positively by saying that as long as I'm here, standards will improve. What do you see the the main change or picture being throughout the summer ahead of the new season? Yeah, there are there are some difficult teams in that division. You know, their season's not finished yet, but it's Swindon looking good lately. Bradford are always a big name. Um, obviously the people that don't go out via the playoffs as well. But you never look at say so Northampton, for example, look like they're potentially going to go up automatically now. If you've got Northampton, you wouldn't think, oh, it's a tough game this weekend if you've got them in League One. But in League Two, that's one of the toughest games. So nothing nothing attacks you straight away in terms of this is going to be a really hard game. Obviously, as the season goes on, that, that will change probably. But yeah, I think over the summer, um, we need about a million new players. And we need to, as, as much as easy as it said than done, trust Harris because he's proven he's a lot better a manager than the level we're at, than the team we are really. Um, apologies um in terms of like what 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 we've got to offer this season he proved he was a lot better than than the players he now wants to get rid of um he needs to get the staff in he wants he needs to have the structure he wants he spoke a lot about building a structure over the next couple of years or so and that's not going to happen overnight but we need to trust him to do that we need to let him do what he wants to do and hopefully um you know we can get back out of that division sooner rather than later I suppose really, that is sort of the only saving grace about relegation. I suppose the fact is that we have Neil Harris, a manager who's clearly dedicated. He wants the best for the club. He wants to make all his decision. I'm sure he's, he said he never wanted to come here and manage in League Two. And I'm sure now he's thinking he doesn't want to manage in League Two for more than one season. He wants to get us straight back out at the right end. I think that is the main positive. If we were going down into League Two, having given Love all the job to the end of the season, or Steve Evans potentially still be here, we'd be looking at it a lot more in a lot more bleak nature. But it is, it is a massive positive going into League Two with someone like Neil Harris. You have someone there who you believe can get you back out the right way rather than stagnating for a few seasons like a lot of teams who have come down for League One have been doing. Yeah, Harris still being here is key. Because um, despite the relegation, I think the Paul Harris will have, I still fully back him to build a better squad for us next season in League Two than what we've been playing with this season in League One. Um he touched on it in it. What well, didn't touch on it, he spoke quite heavily about it in his interview after the Rotherham game. That apart from O'Keefe and, and Thompson, in a way, this, this squad we've got now completely lack leadership. They were lifeless. Um, and that's a really important thing for him to mention. If you just think back to the last time we was in League Two and when we won that division, we had Nelson, we had Burton, we had Frampton, we had Barrett, we had Leg, we had Kedwell, we had Lee, full of leaders. Um, and we're going to need that next season. League Two isn't a kids' division. Um, we know that. We've seen enough of it. Um, every every game's a battle. Anyone can beat anyone. Um, and we're going to have to get the right characters and if we want to go up, as well as quality. Of course, we're going to need that quality like we had last time we was in League 2 to, to put the ball in the back of the net out, out hopefully, and keep it out the other end. But, yeah, leadership is 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 going to be crucial. And Harris, you know, like he keeps mentioning, he, he knows the football club well enough. He knows what we demand as supporters. And I, I fully trust him and Nicky Shaw to get the right people in. I'm not saying we're going to go and win the league next season. Um, there's a lot to happen between now and then over the summer to make that kind of prediction. But he mentioned that the aim has to be for us to be in the playoffs at least. And I, I don't see why that won't be a feasible expectation come the, come the start of the season in late July, I think it is now, this year. Starts on my birthday, so we're going to having a trip to Barrows to look forward to on that day. Uh, he is sort of risking a lot, isn't he, Lewis? Because a lot of people who look at Neil Harris before he took this Gillingham job, they think is a championship manager, managed at Millwall, managed at Luton, and now he's going to be managing League Two, I suppose it would have been quite easy for him after this relegation just to think, well, you know, I tried, but I know my capabilities. I'm not someone who should be managing a League Two, so thanks, but I'm going to go and look elsewhere and try and get another job. But it is seeing it through. We're just going to end on this because we've got a couple of minutes left. But like it says a lot about him as a character and how much he cares at the club that he's willing to go down a division with us rather than doing the easy option, I suppose, and thinking, well, as I say, I've done all I can. I'm going to go back up and manage where I feel like I should be managing my capabilities. Yeah, I mean, he he got Millwall up, didn't he? And then he was in the Championship, and then and then he was at Cardiff as well, and he was he was just games away from being a Premier League manager, really. So, 
I think when he came to Gillingham, people were shocked anyway. We thought, you know, maybe it's a deal to the end of the season to try and save us. Save us if we go down, he's gonna he's gonna go elsewhere. I think he was linked with the Ipswich job just before he came to us. So it is, it is a weird one. Neil Harris is not a League Two manager. Um, he would have been well within his rights to move on. He still would be well within his rights to move on. Um, and managing at least League One, one of the bigger teams in League One. Um, but yeah, it does. He's committed to the task. He's got a massive challenge on his hands. He knows what he signed up for. And uh, yeah, I mean, he's got a couple of years to to prove him. He's not got to prove himself, but take on this challenge that is a bit different to what he's been used to before and build his profile a bit more and help help Gillingham Football Club as well, which he obviously cares about. Yeah, well, that is it for the ME Terry podcast today. We will be back at some point during the summer, but obviously... In the coming weeks, in terms of content, there's not that much to go through. I think the uh, we're all going to be waiting on the official retain list to come out rather soon. I know a few clubs have, uh, have released theirs recently. I think Morecambe did theirs today, so hopefully Jules will get theirs up at some point. Maybe before the end of the week, if we're lucky, maybe early next week. But uh, we should get a better view of what to expect the Gillingham side to uh, be without as we get in this soon and see what players we will be here next season, which ones won't be. We obviously know a few that are going to be on their way. But until then, it has been a rather horrible episode to do. I'm sure both Reese and Lewis wouldn't really want to be here on a Monday night talking about how their beloved club have been uh, put down into League Two. But such is the realistic and harsh nature of football. Uh, thank you all for listening to all the podcasts throughout the late end of the year. We'll be back sometime in the next few weeks, hopefully. But until then, as we look forward to League Two, season, uh, League Two football at Gillingham, it's good night from me. Reese, Lewis, thanks for coming on. We'll see you again soon.